Everybody, I am here with Tom House, the father of modern pitching mechanics and pitching Yoda. Are we going to go by that? Pitching Yoda or the Forrest Gump of pitching? I don't know. You can pick and choose whatever you like. <laughs> I might go with the Forrest Gump of pitching. I like that. That's good. Um, so let's let's start at the beginning. Like, how did you get started in pitching? I mean, obviously, you've been everywhere. You've 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 coached the greats, but how did you get started? What is your personal story? I had the, the same leave it to beaver upbringing that is, you know, fortunate in the fifties and sixties. I started playing, they didn't even have little league at the time. I started playing youth baseball, played all sports, but baseball was the one I had the most fun with. And wherever I went, I played. And we went from Portland, Oregon, where I was a youth player, moved to Los Angeles, which was precipitous because all of a sudden we got good weather year round and played in Pony and Colt and American Legion, had a good high school career, uh, good enough to get a scholarship at USC, actually drafted by the Cubs out of high school, but um, my, my parents were education first, at, you know, sports second. So I went to USC and I put up good enough numbers there, I think because I had Hall of Fame players that scouts came to watch and they had to see me on occasion also. So I got into the pro game through the back door. And uh, when I was going through minor leagues and actually got to the big leagues, I realized how much I didn't know. And I made a, a, you know, a vow to myself that if I ever went towards coaching, that I want to make sure that what came out of my mouth, I didn't have any questions, that it was the best available. So that's kind of in a nutshell. I love that because, and I don't know if you even know my story, but that is literally how I got started doing what I'm doing. I didn't want to teach kids the wrong thing. If I'm going to teach, I'm going to try to teach it right. So I did as much research and homework and learning as I could, both for my kids and other kids, and try to share that and bring it forward. So we're kind of alike in that way, except you pitch in the major leagues. And kudos to you, Rob. The reason I'm talking to you is exactly that reason. You put kids first and the quality of information and instruction you have to be real careful because I think you've probably seen it or heard it from me. You know, sports are games of failure coached by negative people in a misinformation environment. And people like yourself go a long way in making it a more positive thing for kids, which is awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And I know we've gotten to know each other over this you know, last few months. And, and that's what kind of drew me to want to talk with you because I think you're a very positive influence and you kind of, you know, you don't know all the answers. You have a growth mentality. And to me, that is the key to coaching. I mean, you shouldn't know all the answers. No, and if you ever think you do, you got to get out of the game because it's the, the learning curve is exponentially faster now than it was when I first signed. And what you have to do, and, you know, we've gone back and forth this, you, you take the best of what was, combine it with what the best currently is and cross your just cross your fingers about what's coming down the pike. Do you ever, so this is a, do you ever wish that the technology that was available today was available to you when you were playing? Is there anything that you're jumping out going, man, if I only knew that? Well, you know, I'm sure that your dad and my dad wish that they had what we had when we were growing up. I don't know how old you are, but you know, there are eras and, and where I got really lucky was I was the tail end of old school and the beginning of new school. And with that transition came technology. Um, and you know that I, I went out and bought a motion analysis system, an aerial system, and just started capturing athletes at a thousand frames a second. And the, the truth is I looked at that data for three years without even knowing what I was looking at. Had no friggin' clue but I knew there was something there that would improve what we thought we were doing when I went through the system. And, it, and I think we've tweeted back and forth. I, I realized that our eyes sometimes lie to us. When you get it at a thousand frames a second, you realize that what you think you're seeing with your eyes isn't really happening. 
And that was the huge epiphany for me. Yeah, because actually, I think, you know, back in the day, you would look at still frames, you would look at pictures in yes. a book, and yes. try and copy that. And now you realize that there's the movement to get to those things that is, is kind of the key. Yeah, and without a doubt, you nailed it. You know, I, I don't know what you were taught when you were coming through, but we used to pull our glove towards our chest when we threw. You know, one of my original teachers was a captain's wheel. As your arm came through, your glove went backwards. Well, it was, it was just the opposite. It was your chest going to your glove, not your glove coming to your chest. But unless you see that at a thousand frames a second, your eyes lie to you. So anyway, uh, you talk about me being lucky. I was lucky to get involved with that and then get surrounded by some people called biomechanists that help educate um, my eyes. And I think the net result after 40, 50 years of screwing up is that our eyes are getting better thanks to technology. That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned you played a lot of sports and this is always a debate. Is it a I can see both sides. There is obviously some things in other sports that transfer transfer to to baseball. Plus, you shouldn't be pigeonholed as a kid. I mean, that's right. kind of right. that's kind of silly to say you're only a baseball player. By the same token, I think a lot of kids play a lot. The kids that play a lot of sports happen to be the better athletes too. Um, right. So you're going to get be a football player. You're going to be a basketball player. Um, so it isn't a magic of playing other sports that makes you a good baseball player. But it there's kind of a give. I, 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 I think early specialization hurts in my, uh, in my opinion, unless that's the only sport someone wants to play. And then, you know, I guess, I, what do you do in that situation? Yeah. And, you know, I call it being personally adaptive. If you've got a kid that, you know, a Tiger Woods that all he wants to do is play golf, well, he's going to play golf. And those deep dives are special. You know, the, the, the kids, assuming the toolkit is there, those guys are going to get really good really quick. But we also know that if you are totally skilled at age, at age 16, that's as good as you're ever going to be if you had specialized. But if you do all sports, it's called neuroplasticity. And if all sports, you have stuff up on the shelf that when you get hurt or you start getting older, you can pull something off the shelf to help you sustain your level of performance. And that's what the Drew Breeses and the Tom Brady's do because they play other sports when they were younger there's something to pull off the shelf as they lose one part of their, you know, maturation process. That, that's, that's really interesting because I think, you know, some people lose that today. There's a race because I think every parent wants their kid to be the best at something. And it's a, it's a stupid game that parents play. I think um, for the right reason, they want their kids to be successful, uh, but they also don't want their kids to, to fail or be the loser out on the court or not be good. So they find something that they're really good at yeah. and, or, or they make them good at something by the best coaches and do all this stuff while taking away both the learning process um, as well as kind of forcing it, putting a lot of pressure on the kid. Again, you're, you're setting me up perfectly here. The, the learning process, if I could recommend a book, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this when I'm talking. Oh, absolutely. There's a book out there called Range that by, uh, I forget the, the author's name, but Range, it's as what is better, you know, where you have a, a multiple things of interest versus one thing of interest. And it turns out that with Range, the, the more difficult something is, the more you're going to learn. Even if you don't solve it at that point in time, it sets your brain and your body up to learn quicker and more efficiently down the line. So what I, what, I, what I say to the individual athletes I work with, depending on their age, that anybody can go good, but you're gonna learn more from your failures than your successes. We actually teach fail fast forward. Now, except for morals, morals and ethics, you can't, you can't be a bad person, you can't lie, cheat or steal. But everything else, if it doesn't kill you, it's a learning experience. And what happens in today's world, and I'm getting a little long-winded, so Keep please going. be patient with me. Parents with good intentions, they, it tears them up when they see their kids fail. And society has become outcome-oriented, where kids are judged by their outcome. And that, in effect, dooms them from getting any better than the last outcome they ran from. I hope that made sense. Where if you, if you can treat failure as a learning experience, then 
failure doesn't hurt. Failure is it's it's a reframing of the way coaches think, the way parents think, and the and the way athletes think. Now, not you. You you kind of figured it out for whatever the reason that failure is part of living, and sports just make it more intense. That's all. And if the parents could be patient with the pain they feel when they see their child, you know, fail and feel bad. You ask a little leaguer an hour and a half after a game, he can't remember the score. He doesn't know whether he struck out with the bases loaded or not. He just knows whether he had a good good time or a bad time. That's all that they care about, fun. So, and, and, and this kind of plays into where we are as a baseball society now, when you have, you know, high level travel ball, everything's about showcases, um, not only spending money on it, parents are invested. Now parents are like, do I want to invest another five? You know, they're treating it like right. it's an investment that puts pressure on the kid too. The coaches have pressure because no one wants to have a losing team. Um, are, were some things better when you are just playing in a sandlot or playing with your friends and learning that way and failing and screwing up and laughing at, at, at each other versus structure? Okay, you mentioned magic word for me, Rob, and it's called sandlot. Um, we talked earlier off camera that, uh, you know, I, I grew up before Little League Baseball was structured, organized, and what kids signed up for. And we just played in the neighborhood. And we fought, you know, you, we, if, if, you, if you couldn't throw strikes as a pitcher, you played right field until you could throw strikes. And you threw a tennis ball against a garage door, pretending you were Sandy Koufax. And, but now the only time kids actually play is when it's a structured practice or a game. And when you're year round baseball or soccer, other sports have the same issue. That specialization creates a kid whose value proposition all deals with that sport and how he's doing in that sport. And I can understand, you know, parents realize that there's college scholarships and there's pro contracts and all, all this stuff that you, they dream about. And then they get invested in their kid um, way more than they should. And it becomes as much about the parent as it does about the child. It, it drives me nuts when I see a little leaguer in the on deck circle looking in the stands at his, at his dad for instruction or walking back from home plate after striking out and looking in the stands to see his dad or his mom. It, it shouldn't be that way, but it is. And that's why shows like this, if we can get it out there, that they don't call it working sports, they call it playing sports. And the, the power of play is what's being programmed out of kids right now. It should be fun, even the screw ups, even the failures if they are a learning experience, will end up being fun for the kid. And that's what we're after. And, and I think some of that has, so baseball naturally, you're the one thing you can tell, and this is a, as a parent watching your kid play, balls and strikes. So you have your kid, you're, you're telling your kid, everybody's yelling at kid, just throw strikes, just have, con and in the end, is that, you talk about neuroplasticity, um, is that taken away from long-term development because they're turning into aimers and not only that, but feeling so much pressure on them to, to do that when you're taking the athleticism out of it? You're dead on. If you and I were, uh, say we were, you know, preteens or teenagers a million years ago, and we, we wanted to go out and hunt some rabbits with some rocks, did, would, would I tell you, if, okay, you got to get your balance, you got to get your posture, if you miss right or left, it's your head. If you miss high and low, it's your front side. And if, if you don't bring rabbits home tonight, you're gonna starve. Would that be any fun? Kids learned how to hunt way back then because they threw rocks and sticks and, until they got good at it. And the, the pressure of, of performance was secondary to just getting it done and, and the repetitions necessary to create that performance. I hope that didn't go too deep, but if you just let it happen, it takes care of itself. Now, how do we get back to that though? Because obviously you don't see, you know, baseball's become, youth baseball's become an industry. There are people that make money off it. There are parents that want their kids to get a scholarship. Again, well-meaning, I, I think most parents care about their kids and that's why they get so invested. 
Um, they, they view their kid as almost an extension of themselves to some extent. That might be a little much, but they care so much about it that it hurts them more than it hurts the kid when the kid fails. So they don't want to see that. Um, so they think having been on the best team, having this structure, making sure you're, you know, it's almost treating it like a job very early on. How do you get, I mean, I guess we can keep talking about it, but I'd love to see, I'd love to see somehow other ways of breaking that down. I mean, do you have any, any great thoughts on that? Well, you, you, and again, you set me up perfectly. If you could visualize some triangles here and we're going to put three triangles together and make a pyramid out of it. And so the first triangle is passion, motivation, and commitment. If, if you have a youngster, say you're a parent with a 10 year old that has a passion about a sport, we'll call it baseball for now. That's awesome. He's passionate about it. That means he's got a need state. When he wakes up in the morning, if he can see a game on TV or he can go out and throw or swing, it, it makes him happy. Then there's the motivation to, to take that passion and kind of structure it around a way you can get, get better with it, whether it's competition or playing in, this, in your neighborhood or whatever it might be. And then there's the commitment that you've signed up for a season. And there's going to be times during a season when a 10-year-old just doesn't want to go to the ballpark but he's got to go because he's committed to it. So that's the big picture. Then there's one, and I'll use your words, where you care too much, you care too much about what people think, and you care more about the outcome than you do the process. This is where it starts getting dicey. And then the third triangle, when we're going to put them all together, is the person you are, the person you want to be, and the person that people see. And a lot of times, kids will be sitting on the bench, or parents will be watching their kid and wondering, why aren't I playing? All right. And it's as simple as this. Go ask the coach, whether you're the player or the parent, why, why aren't I playing? Or why isn't my son Jimmy playing? And the coach will tell you. And you have to be prepared to have your feelings hurt. But if, if literally, if you know who you are and you, you, know, you have a vision on the person you want to be, and those two things aren't helping you get on the team or with the, the coaches you're working with, put all, put all those things together and you've got a pyramid that will literally carry a kid through his development, which is the window of trainability with the nervous system then the window of trainability with muscle then skill acquisition and then skill retention. There's no sophomore in high school that should be expected to have the skills that a big leaguer does. It's an acquisition thing that is age specific. And that's if I'm most proud of anything we're doing right now is everything we're teaching based on our research is age specific and personally adaptive. In other words, I would look at you, if you came out and threw or swung at balls for us, we would literally take your age, your functional strength, we plug all these variables into the equation and we would have you we put in your hands a point in time capacity and a projectable capacity if you fix this, this, and this. And that, that's what this new mustard is all about. We're putting it in a, in a handheld, in a cell phone. The, are, are you married? Do you have children? I do. Um, and, yeah, my, kid, my kid actually uh, is on the Georgia Tech baseball team. Okay, we so went you through all look, this stuff. Yeah, you don't look that old, but yeah, we could actually put in his hands, we could film him running through the analysis and a, a feedback would come within minutes on where he is with his point in time capacity and what it could be if he fixed this, this, and this. So again, putting it in the parent's hands, putting it in the athlete's hands is a point in time deal. So I think the big thing uh, is, is giving parents, empowering parents to be a coach, I think right now you have a lot of parents that are dependent on almost a local, there's always a local baseball player, right? There's some pitcher uh, who does pitching lessons. He might've been really successful himself. He might not know how to communicate that to somebody though, because what made that pitcher successful might've been, you know, a lot of those trial and error for that pitcher's makeup that might not go for a youth pitcher. And, but yet he's trying to teach what he felt down to that pitcher. And I think there's a different level of teaching that is more understand. It's like Michael Jordan may not be a big, great basketball coach because he just, maybe he just did things differently. 
Boy, you are you are literally. I got I got to pal pal around with you more often. You, you you there's you know there's ways kids learn. There's also windows of learnability, and the the way an instructor or a parent teaches may not be the way a kid learns. Someone has to reframe, and it's usually the parent or the coach that have to reframe. And teenage boys, you've been through it. If your son's at Georgia Tech, uh, uh, Kevin Brown territory, if your son's at Georgia Tech, you've been through the teenage years where teenage boys have no frontal cortex. Their brain is like concrete. And from the age 13, when hormones hit, till they're about 20 or 21 years old. And in that time frame, if you're not fortunate enough to get a coach or a parent that understands how to communicate and teach, a lot of those kids go home. And again, the research is out there. We actually have something called focus band right now, where we can actually watch your, if your son was doing a bullpen at Georgia Tech right now, we could put the focus band on and see how his hertz of electrical activity handled what he was doing physically. And we could also address what kind of a learner is he? Is he someone that, um, well, I, I won't go that deep, but someone can actually determine the best way for your child to learn. And if you, you as a parent can't do that and you can't reframe, then you go, then you go find a coach that can. Does that make sense? Oh, a hundred. So this is one thing that I kind of was thinking about. Um, and I've thought about, I mean, I've thought about it for a while, but I think that the, the, the mental game ends up being almost 100, like the way you learn, the way you, you handle yourself, the way you motivate yourself ends up being such a bigger portion of the game than almost your physical skills, like getting 1% better every day, having that tenacity to do it. Yeah. Um, There's your commitment thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause I've seen so many kids who are physically talented. Um, throughout all these years of travel ball, but they weren't mentally talented and they almost, and, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a bad way. It's just either they didn't work on that muscle um, or it's just not the way that they were built up. I think there is a talent that we overlook that is a mental talent. That is the tenacity, the, the, the wanting to improve and the handling of failure and the focus. We actually have numbers on that. We've got research on it. I'll, I'll go to Yogi Berra first. Yogi Berra way back when said baseball, 50% of baseball is 90% mental. So they knew then, and he used to say, don't think you're hurting the team. And what happens if your son is at Georgia Tech, I'll guarantee you that the kids that have the most trouble with sports are smart kids that care too much. They're, they're smart enough to know too much. And because you brought up a yes sir, no sir kid with a good attitude, he also cares a lot about letting you down, his team down, and that combination makes a lot of kids go home. So the ability to identify that, the ability to see where a kid is as he's learning and learning to learn and learning to relearn, which is what experience is all about. It's this continual, um, it's a, a path that never stops. Tom Brady is just as concerned about winning and losing now as he was when he was at University of Michigan. But because of experience, knowledge, and wisdom, he's able to spend less time, less time on things that don't matter. And that is where the youth athlete of, of the world is today. They've got to figure out the things that matter and don't matter specific to them. And there's no right way, but there's a correct way for the individual. So, I th and I think that that's a lot what coaches overlook. So coaches either say, be tough, be, you know, there's one way I, when my kid was growing up, I showed him Max Scherzer. I love Scherzer's attitude. I, Nolan Ryan's attitude where you just want to tear someone's head off. It's me versus you. I'm going to compete. But there's also the Corey Klubers who are just stone faced, robotic Kyle Hendricks who go about their game and they're just, you know, they want to tune everything out. It's about the next pitch. That's all I'm going to do. Um, there's more than one way to do it. And I think a lot of coaches want to input this, this almost uh, either, either you have to listen to me, yes or no, you know, we're going to do this like it's a military thing yeah. or they want to, they want a stone cold killer out there. 
where you can be a stone cold killer without showing it. You can be, or you can be just, just in focus and you have to know what you're dealing with as a coach. You're exactly right. And what you just explained right there is why teams have chemistry because you've got the proper combination of all those things on a, on a winning team. And if, if it requires someone to be a serial killer, you got that guy on the team. If it requires somebody to make a joke or laugh, you got that guy and everything in between. And what we're able to do right now, I don't know if you're aware, but um, my PhD is actually in performance psychology. And we've been trying to come up through various uh, instruments, ways to measure the intra, which is inside of you, and inter, which is how you deal with your personal environment, how to make that work in your sport at the right time, at the right place, for the right, in the right sequence of events. So the technology is out there to measure. And this is what I'm most proud about with the group I hang out with. We're science-based. We come up with measurables and deliverables that are defendable. And for everything we identify as a problem, we actually have something to fix that problem. And we don't have all the answers. We're continually trying to improve. But I think our answers, our fixes, might be as good as anything that's out there right now. That's awesome to hear because I, I think everything's focused on the physical aspects of it, but the physical doesn't matter if you don't have the mental aspects of it. Um, and one similar thing, what you just brought up, and I've made this point before, both in, from a work environment, from a team environment, um, we're overlooking, you know, by the focus of analytics, spin, you know, measurables, which are absolutely important. I mean, you should be like, hey, that's that's one aspect of things and getting the best players statistically uh, is awesome. But if they can't work together, there is a there is a cohesiveness, a, a psychological component of a team that I think we overlook when we're just focused on numbers um, in putting together a team. You're exactly right. And that's one of the things analytics has changed sports across the board. But analytics is, is, is not the only piece of a successful franchise team or kid. And I think what's happening is the pendulum is gonna start swinging back and find the best fit for the mental emotional makeup of a team, not just the statistical validity of how far, how fast, and how often they can throw, swing, or hit. That is brilliant because right now, the reason why people don't focus on it, I think, is because you can't measure it. Like, you know, when you see it, if you can start to measure it, either through testing or whatever you're, I mean, to me, that is a next frontier type thing where we're now measuring the best player and he's going to be the best fit for the team um, to help launch the team to the next level. Rob, but that's coming. And, you know, People aren't going to realize, you know, you're setting me up perfectly. We have, it's called focus band and we can, it looks like a regular sweat band and we can put it on and measure the Hertz of electro, electrical activity for when you stop thinking and start doing, we can tell you whether you've hit the zone or not. And we actually, we can measure now that the zone or the white moments that you, that we have all as athletes, we've all been in once or twice in our life is when thinking is basically inverse, inversely proportional to the stimulus of the environment. Like I'll use the name because he's retired and he won't mind. Andrew Luck is the smartest athlete I have ever been around. He could answer, he would, he would voice what was coming out of my mouth three words into it before I even knew what I was gonna say. You give him a playbook, he could flip, 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 flip. And, and, and 20 minutes later, I had the whole thing ready for next Sunday. Do uh, you mind a real quick story about him? That oh, there? absolutely. Okay, so uh, I'm watching him on TV. The, the, the year that we brought him back from his bad shoulder, he was the comeback player of the year in the NFL. In one of the games, I can't remember which one, the, the ref was running from behind center like they do, why, why Andrew was calling out defenses, and the ref fell down. And Andrew, without missing a beat, continues to call defenses picks the ref up, passes him on the rear end, and sends him on his way. He did not even re – he had to look at game film to know he even did it. What happened with, it, with him is Andrew – the time that Andrew was the best 
was when the most crises, the most crap was going on in the environment. So chaos turned out to be his best friend. And as we started researching it, that's what all the studs do. The elite of the elite, the crazier it gets, the more their world smooths out. And we can actually measure that now. Can everybody achieve that, achieve that level of excellence? Maybe not, but at least we now have a quantification of what is going on with their brain waves, whether they're in what, what focus band calls quiet eye and motion. Quiet eye, when you're thinking, your eyes kind of like twitch a little bit. When you stop thinking and start doing, your, your eyes stop twitching and you, get, you give into the subconscious where you're just autonomic with your activity. Most kids, I'm a perfect example, um, I overthought and overcared and only got into, you know, motion and quiet eye a few times in my career. And that's why I was just a marginal major league athlete. And, but it's teachable now. And that's the exciting thing. And my commitment to you after talking to you today, if we can help your son at Georgia Tech, if we can help you, I don't know if you're a golfer, I don't care what your age is. We can actually identify what's going on between your ears and give you a little roadmap on how to get more out of your performance accordingly. So uh, I don't usually talk about that um, when I'm doing interviews, but I'm throwing it out there. It's, you know, yours for the asking. That's awesome. I love, I just love the, fa the fact that, that now we can put the same amount of focus that we do in the, in the, in the physical measurement stuff to this mystery of, you know, now you can determine maybe this is the guy that I want as a closer because he thrives in these type of situations. Not, not just looking at his analytics or his stuff, but looking at his mental makeup, or this is my game seven starter. That's perfect. And that's where old school, we had to throw him out there enough times, to get enough game performances or swings at the plate to determine whether this guy is a closer, whether he's a starter or somewhere in between. So we can measure it now before, you know, having to wait three years to decide. That's, that's, that's very, very cool. Um, so now, now take it, you've, you've obviously coached some of, <laughs> I mean, two of the greatest, I mean, I foc I focus on them in the off season always because I love focusing on, on, on kind of pitchers of the past, uh, but Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, um, what were, similar between them in makeup? What was different between, uh, between them in makeup? Um, what did you take from, from working with them? Well, the one thing that was similar was a hundred mile an hour fastball and wild in the strike zone. So that will start with there. Um, but I, I got, to, I knew Randy Johnson, he was at USC. I went to USC and played there and he, he followed me about five years, six years later. So I knew him casually as a pitcher at USC. And then obviously saw him sign with Montreal and watched his progress as a, you know, a wild left-hander in the big leagues throwing hundred miles an hour. I got to know Nolan. I was actually a minor league pitching coach with the, the Houston Astros when he was with the Astros. And I got to meet him through a guy named Gene Coleman who was their conditioning coach. So I knew Nolan personally um, when I had just become a coach with the Texas Rangers. So that led to when everybody, he was, kind of, he was a free agent. The Astros were not going to re-sign him. And he signed with the Rangers because of his relationship with Bobby Valentine and the fact that we had motion analysis on premise. And he came to the Rangers for one year we identified his mechanics. We tweaked his functional strength. We looked at his nutrition. Um, his mental emotional makeup was off the charts. So we started giving him an old school picture, the current science and all that. And he embraced it. And what was one year commitment turned out to be eight years. He was a better pitcher his last eight years than he, the previous 18. And the relationship with Randy Johnson, I don't know if you've heard the story, but we're in Seattle and Nolan and I would always go to the kingdom early and get all our work done before everybody got there. So we'd done that and we were sitting in our dugout, which was the first base dugout. 
and Randy was down the first in the, the Mariners bullpen was in the right field area and balls were sizzling by, you know, our dugout at hundred miles an hour. Randy was having trouble. So he finished, he's walking after his bullpen, he's walking by the bullpen. And I said, uh, Hey Randy, how you doing? He said, I'm, you know, not doing really well. Cuss word, cuss word. If I can't start throwing some strikes, they're probably going to ship my weak self to triple A ball. And Nolan popped up and said, Randy, uh, would y'all like to come? We're going to be out here again tomorrow early. Would you like to come and share with us? We'll talk a bit and see maybe we can figure something out. We made one small adjustment in the way Randy was landing in his stride. And six weeks later, he struck out 18 of us in Arlington Stadium. It probably cost me my job. <laughs> That began the relationship with Randy on and off the field. And the, the two of them uh, still communicate. And, and again, both of them Hall of Famers, both of them hard, hard throwers, both of them with an unbelievable work ethic that looked to get better any way they could every day they came to the ballpark. So that's how I got to hang out with them. Now, is it harder for a guy like Randy Johnson to improve his mechanics? I mean, you're talking about a, a really tall frame. I mean, I think everybody assumes that that guy's got all the advantages in the world because he's a really tall pitcher. But I also heard him say that tall guys like me weren't meant to, to pitch. What are the struggles that a guy like that has as compared to, to Nolan? Rob, I'll give you some research data here. The, the average height and weight of Hall of Fame pitchers all right, is six feet, one half inch, 195 pounds. So in your mind's eye, six feet, 200 pounds. We know for a fact that if you're six, five or taller, you are up to three years behind neurologically and physically someone that's only six feet tall. So the reason that, you know, early on that tall pitchers didn't survive baseball because nobody was patient with them long enough to have their six foot five plus frame get skilled enough to play in the big leagues. Right now there's, there's three pitchers in the Hall of Fame that were taller than six five. Steve Carlton, Don Drysdale, and Randy Johnson. There's gonna be more because what they figured out now is those really tall guys aren't gonna put their pieces together till they're 27, 28 years old, 29 years old, and then they're gonna have a great career. Some of them will be a little sooner and some will be a little later, but they're not going to give up on those tall kids anymore. So the, again, the research neurologically has allowed us to be patient with the learning process, the training process of those kids that grow five inches in a, you know, a summer and gain 15 pounds. That, that's, that's really interesting stuff because I've, you see it, like I, you can see how, Pitch, tall pitchers don't necessarily move great when they're younger. They're kind of like those deer that, you know, when the, when the deer is just born, born, everything's everywhere. And then eventually, if you can put it together, I mean, that's kind of a, that's, that's a dangerous combination. Um, and obviously yeah. Randy was one of those guys. Without a doubt. But he's also one of those guys that you looked and was very wild early in his career. If you yelled at him to just throw strikes or to, to just focus on that, you may take away this end result of this amazing Hall of Fame career um, because you're, 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 you're removing those mechanics that are going to make him successful over the long term. Exactly. And you mentioned this twice. When you put outcome ahead of process, when you ask a kid to throw strikes or not strike out, just make contact, they're going to plateau at that level of commitment neurologically and physically that allows them to throw a strike, that allows them to make contact with the ball. When I think what Jack Nicholas was the first athlete I heard where his dad actually told him, swing as hard as you can. Just, I don't care where the ball goes, swing as hard as you can. We'll worry about where it's gonna go later on. So you can program as long as you don't ask for outcome and just allow these kids to run as fast as they can, throw as hard as they can, swing as hard as they can, up to a point, usually junior, senior, and high school, then the pieces will fit together long-term way more efficiently 
then tell them if you don't throw strikes, you're not going to play. If they put that kind of governor on the kid, he's never going to be neurologically as good as his gene pool wants him to be. That, that's, you know, and one thing we keep leaving out is it, it, it is up to the kid and the player. Like we're focusing on, you're going to be the best baseball player you can be. We're talking about being the best in life. You Like you may, <laughs> your parent may want you to be a baseball player. That doesn't mean that you're going to want to be a baseball player as a kid. So baseball isn't like we think of it as life. We're, we're thinking, of, hey, it's a big deal. It's part of life. Um, it may be a bigger, smaller part of life, but you should take from it what you can um, and make you a better person, make you a better husband, wife, uh, somebody at work. You can be a better employee. Um, I think robbing people of that experience of being in a team sport is, is, isn't good, like pricing people out of it, but also limiting to them saying, you're going to be a baseball player. Well, what if I like playing the piano? I mean, that right. could be something too. Yes, all the, all the above. And what happens if, if literally you are doing something without fun and joy, it's not going to work. And your passion and my passion may be the same. It may be different, but it's up to you as an individual to try a number of different things and don't lock on anything too soon. It's okay to be more passionate about baseball than football, but eventually you're going to have to make a choice. And I'll use your words, the lessons of sport, especially team sport, which is basically empathy, affiliation, persistence. Um, you know, when you struggle, when you actually ha have to, to battle against adversity, and then you have to do it in a team environment and eventually realize that where you are on the team is a fit that is determined by how you are as a person and not vice versa. And the, the ability of an individual, and I'm kind of borrowing on what you said, the ability of an individual to feel and understand where he fits in the process is huge. If you think you're like, I could never be Sandy Koufax. I, I wanted to be, but I realized early on that I would never be Sandy Koufax. And then I'm going to throw a lesson at you that you probably heard. The ones I see that survive in the competitive environment don't try to be someone else. They try to be the best they could be. In other words, I want to be the best Tom House I could be. You want to be the best Rob Freeman you could be. And then you can go between the lines not being cocky where you think you're prepared, but being confident that you've done everything you could do to be the best you could be and then see what happens. And then I got this from my mom, when you screw up or you succeed, it's nice to feel good or bad, but it's better to ask yourself why you failed or why you succeeded. And that's the environment that my brother and I grew up in my parents didn't care about the result. They wanted to know why the result happened. And I think that took a lot, of, a lot of pressure off both my brother and myself about surviving in the competitive environment. Because when we went between the lines, we felt we were prepared. And when we got beat, we went back to, okay, what did I do wrong in my process? Did that make sense what I just said? Absolutely made sense. Because I think it's the only way it's repeatable. Um, being successful just be, you know, you can luck into being successful sometimes. Yeah. That's not repeatable. Knowing why you were successful or why you failed. I just actually literally before we got on this, uh, tweeted a comment from Greg Maddox where he said, uh, you know, failing's, failing's okay. Failing the same way over and over again is not okay. You right. wanna learn from your failure, think about it. Um, you know, it's okay to say it's okay to fail, but don't fail the same way. Yes, he's dead right. There's only four outcomes with process. Bad process, bad outcome, you deserve it. Bad process, good outcome, you're lucky. Good process, bad outcome, you're unlucky. And then the ultimate level, good process and a chance for a good outcome. That's where everybody should be in their day-to-day -day approach with sports. That's awesome. Um, I got a question for you. This is a specific question. Uh, back to the Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson. Number one, who did you feel? Uh, I, I know everybody didn't have radar guns back then. Um, 
who did you feel through harder between the two? This is just my own per for my own personal knowledge. And uh, what, give me some stories about how hard Nolan Ryan actually really did throw as far as what you've seen measurably some, some kind of idea. Well, I know for a fact in my experience as a player and a coach on the major league level, Nolan was the hardest thrower day in and day out that I saw ever. And then there's, there's types of velocity. There's real velocity, there's perceived velocity, and there's effective velocity. Nolan literally was the best real velocity I've ever seen. He had close to an eight foot stride. Um, he was functionally strong. Of all the hard throwers that I've ever either measured or been around, he had the best mechanics for a hard thrower. His phrase is, I wanna throw hard easy. My arm is along for the ride. When I do things, when I line, he called it lining up. When I line it up, I don't even feel my arms are even engaged. And if there's a, I'm trying to think of the film, I think it's actually called Fastball. It's on Netflix. Uh -huh. if, you, if you ever get that, if you can get that and watch it, and they extrapolated, they, they literally felt that, that well, they said that Nolan probably was sitting about 105, showing 106. Um, we know for a fact that the Chapman has hit, I think his best was 105. Randy, believe it or not, the hardest we ever had Randy, either in testing or in game conditions, was right at 102. But he released that 102, 48 feet, six inches from home plate. So you add another, as far as perceived velocity, add another five miles an hour of that. So his 102 was more than likely 107. So who was the harder to hit? Well, the statistics will show you that the hardest guy to get a hit off of in the history of baseball was Nolan Ryan. You know who was second? Randy Johnson. <laughs> so your question about who had the best fastball, velocity-wise, Nolan. But with velocity and perceived velocity, uh, Randy was right up there with him. So about, uh, and about that, obviously every sport, it seems like everything's gotten better. I mean, training's gotten better, people have gotten bigger, people have gotten stronger. Why would that be that Nolan Ryan, uh, you know, like Eraldis Chapman moves really, really well. He's an explosive athlete. He's six foot, what, he's six four, um, you know, strong as an ox you watch him. He's, he's also got incredible mobility. Uh, is that a, so I, I've seen the, I've seen the fastball movie. I know the measurements that they use. It seemed like a more of an experimental measurement at that point where they were kind of figuring out where they think the ball got picked up versus. Yeah, they, they're, you're right. They were extrapolating. Yeah. Um, and the, um, the pitch that they thought was the hardest one he threw. And that was actually the 113th pitch of a right. nine inning game. So right. you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually saw the printout where in the first inning they had him at, I, I couldn't tell if there was a radar error because to me, if I have a radar gun in the first inning, I have someone at 88 and in the ninth inning, I have him at a hundred. I'm like, yeah. this thing's a piece of junk. I'm throwing it away. Mm -hmm. But it could be that he also saved something for like, I know he, he also saved stuff for the end and you would know better than I would since, since you were. Can closer. I drop? Can I, okay. You're the first guy that's ever asked this. There's, there's starting pitchers and there's relievers. And they're, you know, basically starters and closers. And then there's starting pitchers who can close. And Nolan was one of those guys. There are a few of them out there today. And Nolan would chug along in a game, you know, 96, 97, seventh, eighth inning, ninth inning, game on the line. The 96, 97 would all of a sudden be 98, 99, 100. He had that gear, whatever it was that allowed him to drop it down into fifth gear and never look back. So that's special. But physically, uh, people don't realize how strong he was and not just because of the weight room stuff, but the genetics and the fact that, you know, he was a Houston kid that threw bales of hay around and shoveled stalls out and built functional strength as did the early generation of sports, most of the athletes came from farming, you know, Bob Feller. Yeah, yeah, farming communities or construction workers where their strength came because of what they were doing in the off season. 
But with training the way it is today, um, we're going to optimize. I know for a fact that the human arm can go 118 miles an hour because we've done that. When I was up at USC with the Raw Data Research and Baseball Institute, we had kids throwing off the mound with a two ounce at 118 miles an hour. So we know the arm can go that fast. Can we functionally strength train it to handle that speed and the durability required of coming down the mound in game condition? So the interesting thing is, and, and this is based on, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a historian too of, of uh, related to pitching. Ryan was one of the first guys to actually physically train, to get strong, to, to, to work out, to, to, to optimize his, his body. Now it's kind of a thing. Like now everybody says that was, that's the thing to do. Tom Seaver was also early, another USC guy, right? Um, right. Where he was ridiculed for carrying around weights and he knew that, that this would make him better. Uh, how is that development? I mean, you've, you've seen it happen. Um, how did people not understand, I guess, that that, you know, you say, obviously, people who grew up on a farm are lifting a lot of stuff, they're getting stronger, they're getting physically strong. Why did people not think that weight training would help translate to the mound? Um, and aren't there a lot of careers that kind of got got messed up, I think, by by not focusing on that, by not saying, hey, we can make you a better pitcher. It was always velocity couldn't be taught. You were either a hard thrower or you're not. Well, it seems right. like it can be taught, right? It can. And we've proved that in the last five, seven years. But when I first signed, I actually had coaches in the Brave organization say, if we see you in the weight room, we're going to release you. And they were partially right because of the way they lifted in those days, bench press and squats you know, big muscle stuff, not realizing that you had to work on the decelerator muscles as much as you do the accelerator muscles. So the big difference was, uh, I'll take it a step back. I've never had a bad arm surfer. I've never had a surfer that had a bad arm. And the, re the reason is when, when you're on a surfboard paddling out to catch a wave, you're working on the decelerators as much as the accelerators. And that kind of led us to conditioning athletes and weight training, where you work on the, the, like three muscle groups accelerate the arm and only two muscle groups decelerate. I'm really simplifying. So you have to work the decelerators. If you want to throw as hard as you can, the decelerators have to be worked one third more than the accelerators, if that makes any sense. And now we can actually with with EMG studies, we can actually see how muscles are engaged in training and in competition, and then workouts are created accordingly. So what do you feel the biggest, uh, the biggest part of, 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 if you were gonna draw up your perfect picture, what would they look, what would you take from, from each of the guys you've been around um, in, in, in cobbling something together, who had the most of it, but also what would you do? Like, who would you, me mental game, uh, growth mentality, physical attributes, uh, stuff. What would, what would you say? Well, um, you're making it really easy. My perfect picture would be six, three, two, ten, with a, with an eight foot stride in one second or less that was functionally strong mentally, emotionally capable. And then the one that is brand new, and I'm glad you brought it up, all the big money and all the big research in sports right now is being aimed toward recovery. So nutrition and sleep and getting an athlete to be able to recover from muscle failure in two days or less, not three days or more, is where everybody is going. So the four keys to the kingdom, mechanics, strength, mental, emotional, and recovery, nutrition and sleep for recovery. So my, my 6 3 two, 10 pitcher would recover in two days. He'd be functionally strong. He would be able to get into the zone. He'd realize that his thinking had to diminish the more crazy things got and started to trust his process subconsciously and allow himself to have fun while he was competing. There's my perfect picture. That's awesome. How did you, so you obviously are, are, are uh, you've worked with 
two huge names in football. How did you get involved in working with, with quarterbacks? What's different in working with football throwers versus baseball throwers? There's a time component, right? I mean, someone's coming oh, yeah. at you trying to get you. Um, yeah. Perfect mechanics ain't going to do you all that much, uh, much help if, uh, you know, you got a 300-pound lineman ready to, to tackle you. So how did you get involved in that? And what differences and similarities do you see in those? Well, uh, it's common knowledge that I got the football idea from a guy named Dick Dent, who was the trainer with the Padres when I was their traveling pitching instructor. And he would have pitchers throw the football because it was heavier for strength. And the, you can't throw a football wrong mechanically and make it spiral. So I'd always been throwing footballs. And then when we got motion analysis capacity from Gideon, getting aerial motion analysis capture, uh, we, we, we got Marino, Montana, Berline, um, Marinovich. We had about five or six quarterbacks in the can. I didn't know what I was looking at. So it was just kind of floating around. And then I forget what year, it's been 15, 16 years. Cam Cameron, who was the offensive coordinator with the Chargers, had a young Drew Brees. He brought by, and I met met Drew early through Cam um, because Cam's kids were playing baseball. And then the following season, uh, Drew hurt his shoulder and I got to be involved with the rehab process. And we brought Drew's arm back with functional strength training that had never been done for a quarterback. And obviously his career took off. And because of him, the quarterback fraternity is really a small group. And he would mention here, there, whatever. And pretty soon, we're, we're, right now, we're working with 28 of the top 32 and about 60 collegiate elite quarterbacks. And you hit it dead on. The only difference between quarterbacking and pitching is the quarterback has a movable rubber trying to throw to a movable target in less time with a heavier object. And other than that, it's the same training the same exact mechanical efficiency. The arm path is the same. The, ar the arm action is the same. The arm path is abbreviated a little bit because it's a 15 ounce object versus a five ounce object. But the, the data is very comparable throwing one. So isn't this strange? So you were talking about working with two ounce balls and now yeah. working with 15 ounce balls there is this whole mystery or, or, or controversy about weighted balls, but a football is a weighted ball. I mean, all a baseball is a weighted ball. Baseball is a five ounce weighted ball. Then you have a two ounce weighted ball. Um, is that much ado about nothing? And part of the training like is to, is to throw different objects and to help your arm develop. Uh, how do yeah, you view there, that? There is, um, there's a lot of good weighted ball programs out there. A few of them have some research behind it. We started our research in 2010 and the weighted balls were designed to help fix GERD, which is glenal humeral internal rotation deficit. Aging pitchers lose if they can go externally huge, but coming forward fast, it goes away with the aging process. Well, we found that um, you could build strength with heavier than a baseball going back but to teach the body or reteach the body or the arm to come fast forward, it had to be lighter than a baseball. And we had done the heavy light stuff with a gentleman, Coop Duran at University of Hawaii. We did a weighted ball program in I think 68 through 70. And then we got involved with a, with a two ounce to the two pound trying to fix GERD and we fixed GERD, but velocities also went up so programs were written accordingly. You train knees, then a rocker, and then a run and gun. Have you like three holes, two throws until the arm is adapted. And that carries over into velocity between the lines in competition. And again, there's good programs out there. I think we're the only ones that have science-based um, measurable and deliverable. Interesting, because I, I, I... Definitely, you know, there was a period of time where everybody was doubting all this stuff and it was, it was a controversy. I think people have now come around to understanding that, that hey, everything is a weighted object. If you're throwing something, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, a rock then, is a weighted but, object, snowball is a weighted object. Yeah, and we found, I, I probably should throw this at you too, that 
the football comes the closest to the most efficient rock you can throw. A one pound rock will get you close enough to the animal to where if you don't kill it and you only wound it, you're still far away to far enough away to run away from it. But it turns out of all the things we throw, a one pound object works best with the human body and the human arm. That's what we're seeing right now. I like the idea of being able to run away from it too. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you only wound, then you gotta be fast on your feet. <laughs> I didn't think about that aspect of it. That's awesome. Uh, what what mentally have you seen? So is there a common thread between a Drew Brees, a Tom Brady, a Nolan Ryan, a Randy Johnson, um, whoever you want to, what, 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 what do you see in those guys that, that you say they got it, or you can say, looking back on it, that this is what makes them special? The, with these elite athletes, and again, I'm truly blessed that I got to our original samples were all big leaguers and Hall of Famers. I didn't have to go to the general population and try to project up. And the one thing I see is not only that are they committed to getting better every day, but they go between the lines knowing that they've done everything they could do to best to be the best they could be. And they'll give it to you, whether they feel great or whether they feel terrible, they can give you the same output no matter what the scenario is. And I think the game is changing to where that 250, 300 inning pitcher, the 300, 300 strikeout a year guy is gonna be a thing of the past. But those pitchers and then the quarterbacks that are durable, the ones that are out there long-term have been able to put it together mentally, physically and avoid injury for any length of time. So if you look at it, um, and remember avoiding injury, whether it's from repetitive movement trauma or real trauma, is a function of recovery and strength as well as mechanical efficiency. They're just, <laughs> their, their gene pool was really good to start with, but their commitment to, to process uh, is way better than anybody else's. So how important is, uh, you mentioned gene pool, you mentioned commitment process, um, and, and then there's access to coaching and stuff, which you're hoping right. to solve with, with, with mustard. Um, yes, what is the most important aspect of it? Is it your gene pool or is it the, the other aspects of it? I mean, there's always a ceiling on how hard you can throw, but there's also yeah. limits to that and your ability to work and, and, and tap into that. Well, I'm, I'm a perfect example. You know, I never threw on a gun. I never threw harder than 82, 83 miles an hour. But I figured out because of science, I figured out if I could stride a little further and throw backwards, slow, slow, fast, that with effective velocity, I, I could make my fastball look better than it actually was. And then being able to throw a curveball for a strike and I was left-handed, that helped. But there has to be a, a certain amount of genetics to compete at the elite level. And assuming that that base is there, then what you do with the periphery stuff determines how successful you're gonna be. So my, I was, my velocity was less than, when I first got to the big leagues, the average big league velocity was 87, 88. And me at 82 to 83, I was a below average velocity guy, but I knew how to pitch throwing backwards, which is effective velocity. I could make the ball move and I could throw a curve ball for a strike. I also held runners close and I was durable. So that allowed me to be a marginal to horseshit pitcher for eight years in the big leagues, but consistently marginal. <laughs> <laughs> is, so the other thing that I'm thinking of is, is there, there's an optimal throwing pattern potentially for an individual to throw his or her maximum velocity. Is that necessarily the best mechanics to get people out? Because there's also deceptiveness that you can be, maybe it's not your optimal throwing pattern, but there's a deception, either it's effective velocity, you're closer to play, but you're not optimal physically, or it's hiding the ball, or it's your, as a different arm slot than, than somebody's used to seeing, and you're able to get people out. You had Devin Williams this year throw a unicorn pitch, which was his changeup that nobody sees, a 3000 RPM uh, changeup that's just dying. 
Um, is there that aspect to it that maybe you're, you're, you're striving to be optimal, but you're taking away from the deception? There's, there's more than, there's so many different aspects. To this yeah, and that's where you have to have, again, a, a coach that isn't stuck with one way or one vision. And normally that will take care of itself in baseball. If you've got a Trevor Hoffman, um, change up a buds winning change up that pitch is going to take you somewhere if you can throw in knuckleball that pitch is going to take you somewhere if you have any kind of a curveball that pitch is going to take you somewhere and then you have to add the other pieces having a great curveball without a good move to first base being left-handed um, if you can't hold runners close then double plays aren't in order and in other words there has to be more than just one Thing that's a flaw or a number of flaws to keep you from being a big league athlete. But assuming the base level is there and you take care of the other things, I think a lot of kids go home because they just haven't been afforded the opportunity to develop another pitch or to develop more deception, moving on the rubber, you know, changing an arm slot. And you've been around the game long enough. There's one set of rules, but there's a million interpretations. Exactly. I also think there's a financial component that is driving people from the game that you have people that could be among the greatest players ever and they're choosing either another sport because they just, you know, they see all their friends with $500 bats and $2,000 travel teams and $100 an hour, $200 an hour, whatever it is, coaches. Um, democratizing the game and allow, is, is going to help the game grow, bring in more fans. Because now yeah. this is something that you could be as a player. Um, we're not closing the door to it, but also help the game get better. Um, and that's what I like about the app. I think that that's opening the door to making everybody a coach. Rob, you, you're making my job so easy. You just explained exactly what the Mustard app is all about. We want to democratize the infor information and instruction that the elite athletes get, give it to a mom and a dad, of the 100 million preteens that are out there and see if there we can find a few more Nolan Ryans or a few more Drew Breeses or a few more Rob Freelands, whoever it might be. Is and there a tweeting that, part of it to see how good they tweet? <laughs> <That's it. laughs> or someone that someone that like you did, you understood the value proposition of being a source where tweets can show people how they can communicate and everybody gets better for the experience. And in other words, making technology work for you and not against you. Right, and I think what, what people end up doing, and this is on the <coughs> side online, is they try to prove how smart they are and they don't listen to anybody. And it just becomes a, a talking at people versus trying to learn from people and asking real questions. Like people ask questions more to prove how smart they are versus asking questions or challenging someone, but listening to the answer and learning. And to me, that's the best part of social media. The worst part is yeah. shooting at people. Someone puts up their mechanics and you're making fun of them and saying, oh, you could do, and then you're driving people from the game. Um, that yeah, doesn't help anybody. Exactly. And unfortunately in today's world, a negative tweet or a negative observation will generate more looks than something positive. So we don't fight with anybody. You know, we'll put our stuff out there. Um, we're happy with what we're doing. We're kind of self-enclosed. We welcome criticism. If I get criticized, I obviously will look and see whether the criticism is deserved. Um, the bottom line, when you have your format and you're putting, the, putting it out there on a venue that can be taken in by a whole lot of people, I honestly believe the whole sports world gets better accordingly. So there just needs to be more of you and you set it perfectly. You don't want to criticize, you know, put out what you believe in and take your lumps accordingly, but you can't make yourself look good by making someone else look bad. It's not necessary. Just be a part of the learning process and see what happens. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, and that's, I, I think that's, that's what attracted me to, to, I mean, I saw your tweets. I saw how positive you were and I thought that this would be a good opportunity to, to let folks see what, what you're all about and how you're trying to pay the game or pitch the game forward. Uh, who, so today, you're looking at today's pitchers, 
who jumps out at you as somebody that you would maybe you don't coach today and you'd like to coach you see them as having all the makeup of uh you know some of the some of the the greats uh you know who who do you tune in to watch um either football or or, or baseball or both well you know i'll go football because it's the easiest Mahomes obviously is a young combination drew Brees, tom brady um, I really, I really think DeGrom, uh, of all the pitchers that are out there, kind of represent our true model. Kershaw, for various and assorted reasons, he, he hasn't got the perfect movement model, but all the other pieces are there. I mean, you know, Araldus Chapman is very special. Um, there, I'll tell you what, I am more proud of the pitching coaching community today than I was 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, I knew we were better than 50 years ago. And I think the best is yet to come. As long as individuals like yourself keep pushing the envelope through a vehicle like we're doing right now. Well, I love that because I, I think the game can only get better. And I love conversations like this, where hopefully this inspires young pitchers, parents, coaches to be more open-minded. But also the next great coach. I mean, I'd love, <clears throat> I'd love to see someone come up and you know take this and run with it and just be better and help the next generation of of, of athletes. So yeah. put a mustard app in your hand, and you you can become your own best coach. So where can we get the the mustard app? Oh, I, I'm glad you asked. I, I, you can tell I'm not much of a marketer. If, if, if <laughs> you have if, the if hat maybe, on though, I mean that's marketing. I, yeah, I did. Re, I did remember that. That's the bonus. <laughs> But if you go to Team Mustard, M-S-T-R-D, Mustard Without the Vowels, teammustard.com, that'll kind of give you an indication of where we are and where we're going. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll hang out with you anytime, Rob. So don't, don't be afraid to, to, to get in touch with me off screen if I can ever help you with anything, okay? Awesome, I would love to. Um, and I, I, I actually would love to see the results of the app, but I, the mental part is so interesting to me. So I'm excited about what this can do, both from a physical standpoint, as well as a mental standpoint, because I see that come up all the time. Um, here, here. Maybe this will be the beginning of pushing it even harder. Love it. Well, thank you for taking your time to, to talk with me today. And uh, it's been a, a pleasure. Time. This is awesome. Thank I, you. I agree. Happy holidays, and we'll talk soon. All right, you too. See you, Rob. See you. Pitching Ninja! Pitching Ninja!